Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Harditz, and today we continue our Fantasy Files series with a look at none other than A.J. Brown. If you have listened to this podcast before, you have undoubtedly heard myself and probably plenty of the guests as well reference A.J.B. wide receiver one season. That's because it's always been A.J.B. wide receiver one season, really since he got handed, not handed, since he earned the starting job that really should have been his from day one, but it actually took the Titans about six weeks to give it to him back in 2019. I mean, it really is funny when you look back. I mean, Brown, I mean, it was just almost like painting the picture for like what we should expect from Brown, even his first like six games in the league. Week one of his first ever NFL game, the Browns decided to have Denzel Ward travel with Corey Davis and Brown accordingly turns his four targets into three catches for 100 yards. A couple weeks later, they're facing the Falcons. Brown caught three targets. He caught them all for 94 yards and two touchdowns. After that, Brown was done playing under 50% of the offensive snaps. So, you know, all Taiwan Taylor, Tajay Sharper, whoever it was holding back Brown for about four weeks aside, ever since he's gotten this job, again, he's just been one of the NFL's best wide receivers. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The only reason why you maybe don't think of him that way is because he doesn't have massive counting statistics. He's been really good and he's you know also missed two games uh, earlier in 2020 dealing with a knee injury. If you didn't see, he actually had to have surgery on both knees after the season. So it's even crazier that he put up these numbers the way he did. But in 2019 as a rookie, 52 catches, 1051 yards, eight touchdowns, and 2020 70 catches, 1,075 yards, 11 touchdowns. Great numbers. I just, I'm, I get it though. It's not numbers that you would just immediately slot in as a, you know, a top five real life receiver. But people, that changes when we start looking at the efficiency. Because again, I do understand the idea that, you know, more talented players will earn targets. If you're out there and you're not getting targets, you know, I, I, it's hard for me sometimes to, talk about Henry Ruggs because he didn't have more than, I don't even think he had one game last year of more than five targets. And the argument is, okay, did Ruggs not produce because he didn't have the targets or did Ruggs not produce because he wasn't good enough to beat out Nelson Aguilar for the targets. So with that in mind, I do think Brown falls in the category of like, we just need to get this guy more targets because the Titans had the third fewest pass attempts in the league last year. It wasn't like, I mean, you know, n- no hate to Corey Davis or Adam Humphreys or even Khalif freaking Raymond, but you know, the Titans just weren't throwing the ball a ton. It wasn't like Brown was just failing again and again to kind of beat out his teammates. So with that all in mind, over the past two seasons, among 77 qualified wide receivers with at least 100 target, A.J. Brown comes in as tied for fourth in PFF receiving grade, tied for fourth in yards per reception, second in yards after the catch per reception, tied for number two in yards per outrun, and number one in PFF's own wide receiver rating metrics. So the one spot I want to harp on here, because again, The fact Brown had 30, he's 31st in targets. Again, people like, that is crazy to me. He should be fifth. He should be sixth. It's not the case, unfortunately. So the one stat I really want to break down here that I think shows just how good and special he is as a talent is that yards after the catch. I mean, that's what really breaks out when you watch A.J. Brown. I mean, the touchdown he had against the Ravens with, you know, two minutes left in their regular season uh, come, come, come from behind eventual overtime win where, you know, he's carrying like three guys into the end zone. He catches the crossers against the Colts and the Steelers where you're like, okay, you know, here's a ho-hum 10-15 yard gain. No Never mind, he outruns your entire secondary. Like the amount of times, I believe it was uh, actually PFF's own Mike Renner who kind of made this point. Uh, the amount of times you see fast players just underestimate AJ Brown's like speed and take bad angles at him, you just see it again and again and again. He takes these slants and crossers all the way to the house, and it's wild to see a player that's six foot, about 230 pounds, have this sort of speed. And for him to have this average yards after the catch of 7.3 yards, like people, we don't see players like A.J. Brown at the top of this metric. The only other guys to average over six uh, yards after the catch per reception over the past two years, Debo Samuel, Hunter Renfro, and Robert Woods. I mean, their average target depths are all at 7.6 or fewer yards. A.J. Brown is at 12.3 yards. Over the past decade, we only have two wide receivers that have averaged at least six and a half yards after the catch per reception and have a double-digit average target depth. A.J. Brown and Josh Gordon, hashtag free Josh Gordon. So truly people, AJB, you know, he looks the part of an alpha number one receiver. That's because he is an alpha number one receiver. And now we can only hope that 2021 will bring with us the sort of volume that he deserves. And it really just might everybody. And if you've, uh, you know, been staying up to date on your fantasy football stuff throughout this offseason, I'm sure you've heard the idea of, you know, vacated and available targets 
float around just plenty. So all that is, it's taking, you know, the total amount of targets from 2020, looking at who is now no longer on the roster in 2021 and showing where the most opportunity is. It can be a little bit deceiving sometimes, you know, like I've seen the Panthers float around a lot and yeah, they did lose a lot from Curtis Samuel. The problem is Terrace Marshall, a top three, time second round actually wide receivers coming in and just the most, you know, target hog running back in the league and Christian McCaffrey will be back as well. So, you know, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But with that said, we can kind of tell what situations could potentially enhance someone getting more and more targets. So anyway, four offenses have at least 200 vacated targets from last year. The Lions, the Jaguars, the Titans, and the Panthers. Only three units have at least 2,000 available air yards. The Lions the Jaguars and the Titans looking at these teams real quick guys I think we all see the Lions are dealing with probably the single worst wide receiver group in the room also have Jared Goff the Jaguars latest shtick is deciding that Tim Tebow is going to be their version of Taysom Hill I complain about them enough on the uh, Wednesday and Friday edition of this podcast I'll save you the uh, you know rant here and then also I mean Sam Darnold he's another guy that we've talked about this on another fantasy file objectively bad professional quarterback I'm not all that confident in that the vacated targets going to his receivers and the offense are even going to help all that much because we could see a similar uh, just reduction in efficiency. So that leaves us with the Titans, who I think have really been the top spot throughout the offseason for either a free agent or for a rookie receiver to come in on. When the, the Packers as well because of Aaron Rodgers, but even the Packers, as we're seeing with Amari Rodgers, like it's a great spot for him, and I think his dynasty value should be skyrocketing, but there's no guarantee that Alan Lazard and to an even higher extent Marquez Valdez scantling are falling out of a favor and three wide receiver sets anytime soon. The Titans were always the place that had two wide open positions, Corey Davis and Adam Humphreys in the starting lineup, just wide open and really no viable replacements. You can even throw Khalif Raymond, their, you know, number four primary field stretching threat. Right now, people, the only other wide receivers, the main ones that we should expect them to be competing uh, for these spots, Josh Reynolds, in my opinion, good, not great, complimentary wide receiver from the Rams, just a guy. I mean, I would say he's the favorite to, uh, you know, lead the way in secondary targets behind Brown, maybe Anthony. Anthony Ferkser, but you know, Reynolds to me just isn't someone I'm getting hyped up enough to think that he can make good use out of the 80, 90 targets that we're kind of thinking a number two wide receiver might have here. We got Nick, West, Nick Westbrook, Akini. I'll learn to pronounce his last name better if he becomes a factor, but he's a second year former undrafted free agent, just three career receptions to his name. Chester Rogers, ex Colts backup wide receiver, should struggle to do much more and just take some snaps in the slot. Cameron Batson has earned 24 targets in 23 games for the Titans over the past two years. Biggest thing with Batson last year, like he's fine. I don't think he's going to be more than the gadget guy. For whatever reason, he had four rush attempts and A.J. Brown had zero. Go back to 2019 and look at the last time they gave Brown a regular season rush attempt and he takes that reverse against the Saints like 50 yards to the house. Maybe they didn't want to give Brown any extra touches because of his knee problems. I would understand that. But with that said, man, if Brown's got some healthy knees in 2021, please, for the love of God, give this guy some design runs. Just get the ball in his hands any way you can. Uh, Rush attempts, as we're seeing, you know, in the modern NFL tend to be a good way to do that sometimes with your wide receivers. Uh, we also have fourth round pick Des Fitzpatrick. You know, he just be, by virtue of coming to the Titans, I mean, he's getting a bunch of hype now. 4-4-3, second 40-yard dash helps. But, you know, this is someone that it's... <laughs> I don't want to call him a bust or a reach or anything. We haven't seen the guy play, and people only call players reaches if it doesn't match their own big boards. So maybe Des Fitzpatrick, you know, is great, but certainly seems like a, a big a bit of a stretch for someone to walk into this offense and immediately make plays. Also got Cody Hollister. Maybe my favorite second option on the Titans is Marcus Johnson, who's a 27-year-old wide receiver, spent most of the last three years with the Colts. And, you know, whether it's Jacoby or Phillip Rivers, who, you know, at least a 2020 version of Rivers, you know, and along with Jacoby, Kobe aren't exactly throwing you the most steady, uh, consistent dose of, you know, on target deep balls. And Johnson really continued to make the most out of his uh, opportunities. So honestly, like, I don't think any of these wide receivers, the complimentary ones are worth chasing in fantasy land right now, but gun to my head, who do I think is the number two, the second best real life talent, Marcus Johnson. So please don't get cut in preseason camp, uh, Marcus. I'm pulling for you, man. With the tight end room, I mean, Anthony Ferkser, I understand the hype for him. He actually lands in my uh, tier four of tight ends where, yeah, I could see him being a tight end one going into next season. You know, he had three games uh, with more than five targets. And in those games, he's gone eight catches, 113 yards in the tutty, five catches, 51 yards, and then one three catch, 19-yard bust. 
The only concern I would say and the reason why I would take someone like Adam Troutman ahead of Ferguson is we don't know if he's getting this full-time role. I mean, he has only played one game with more than 50% of the offensive snaps, or excuse me, two games, two of his 47 career games, he's played more than 50% of the offensive snaps. I know Johnny Smith is gone, but even when Johnny was gone, he wasn't playing this like every down role like a Cole Komet or an Adam Troutman. So I think Jeff Swain is going to continue to be annoyingly involved. And my goodness, you know, if you watch these Titans games, and I would say the Bills are right up there too like no offense throws more touchdowns to random offensive linemen or like number two number three tight ends so I like Ferkser and he's not you know all that expensive but I would just say you know commit Troutman if it's a tie between these guys you know in terms of projected targets give me the guy that we at least expect to be on the field a bit more often so again people empty passing game vacated targets galore, galore and the thing is now, at this point, the only way we can kind of stick a, you know, a hole in the A.J. Brown wide receiver one argument is, hey, what happens now if the defense just focuses all their attention on stopping A.J. Brown since there's nobody else to take away attention? We just don't see this really happen in you know recent history. If, you, if you're kidding, as many targets as we're projecting Brown to get, you know we see these guys show up. So a bit of an arbitrary threshold, but we'll go with 150 targets. That's what we see a lot of just high-end alpha wide receiver one receivers and empty offenses get. And we've had 65 wide receivers meet that threshold in the season since 2010. Their average finish has been as the PPR, overall PPR wide receiver 6, 91% finish in the top 12. The only three guys to not post top 24 production, 2012 Larry Fitzgerald, 2016 DeAndre Hopkins, and 2016 Allen Robinson. I can see Ryan Tannehill taking a little step back. He's been awesome, and Arthur Smith, is, Arthur Smith is gone. Doesn't have anybody else to throw to other than A.J. Brown. Like It would make sense if he takes a little step back. With that said, people, do not put him even in the same conversation as these other quarterbacks that you know really messed up Fitz, Hopkins, and Robinson. I mean, they were catching balls from John Skelton, Kevin Cobb, Ryan Lindley, Brian Hoyer, Brock Osweiler, Tom Savage, and really the best one of the group, Blake Bortles. And we saw him, you know, tank Robinson. <laughs> one good year, Robinson. One bad year, Robinson. Immediately after. So even if Brown is just you know doubled again and again and again with the way we see wide receivers just make the most out of the volume, I think he'll be just fine. Even if he he doesn't people we just got a whole season's worth of evidence that Brown doesn't need high-end target volume to be a wide receiver one. He had 106 targets in 14 games last year, and he was the PPR wide receiver six in points per game and the wide receiver 12 overall. So, like, last year and even 2019 were, like, already his kind of worst-case scenarios in terms of having to play banged up, having, like, legit target competition in the offense, being in this run-first system, and all those things are just looking better than ever. So, Titans defense, maybe they get a little better because they can't be that bad again, but it's not like they did enough, in my opinion, to really transform uh, their unit. I think they're going to still have problems getting pressure, consistent pressure, and because of that, I think we'll continue to see a lot of shootouts. I mean, just in terms of the teams that uh, you know really have a great offense and a correspondingly bad defense, which is what we should be trying to target in fantasy land. I mean, the Titans are just sticking out alongside you know the Raiders and some of these other squads. I'm trying to find the statistic with it. Yeah, so the largest differences and points per game rank on offense versus defense last year. The Raiders and the Titans were tied for first. And we also had the Vikings, the Bills, the Lions, and the Packers. But, I mean, I think I don't know if people realize quite how bad that Titans D was last year. Tough to expect, you know, a huge improvement. And because of that, I think we could see them again, you know, having this top 10, top 5 scoring offense with the corresponding bottom 10, bottom 5 defense. So, the one elephant in the room, what happens if Julio Jones comes? You can't go a day on A.J. Brown's Twitter without him actually, you know, coming out and trying to recruit Julio himself. Already saying he'll give up 11. You know, I think he wants to wear number eight or something and said if uh, Julio comes to town. But people, like, it's just not a huge issue again because we just saw A.J. with a, a similar guy that they're going to treat as a you know wide receiver 1A, 1B in Corey Davis. And no, I am not saying Corey Davis is as good as Julio Jones. Jones. He will never be. But I mean, Corey Davis was still someone this organization drafted with the number five overall pick, and he was good enough to earn 92 targets in 14 games last year. And again, Graphic guys, do not say this. I am not saying Corey Davis is better than Julio Jones. It is pretty wild, though. If you want to go ahead and just look at what their production was last year, we do kind of see a case to be made where it, uh, we can see A.J. Brown continue to thrive. I mean, last year, Corey Davis, 87.2 PFF grade. Julio, 86.4. 
both of them 15.1 yards per reception. Davis, 4.4 yards after the catch per reception. Julio, 4.5 yards per route run. Corey Davis, 2.58. Julio, 2.6. Julio Jones was a top five receiver in the league when he was healthy last year. Corey Davis largely had top five, top 10 efficiency numbers. I know he had some really annoying duds right when we would start to trust him in fantasy land, but it... AJ was already playing alongside a really great receiver last year, and it just didn't matter. I don't expect Julio to come in and worry about it because, again, we already have evidence that AJ Brown, if he's even not given the high end volume, he's enough of a monster to make do with the enhanced uh, efficiency. And I mean, adding Julio to the equation, he's certainly going to take more, uh, you know, pressure off AJB than Corey Davis ever did. So we can see, you know, AJB sort of even even higher heights efficiency wise if Julio uh, comes to town and replaces Davis. So for me, A.J. Brown, with Julio Jones, he's a wide receiver one. Without Julio Jones, he's a wide receiver one. Because again, I'm defining that as a top 12 fantasy wide receiver. You guys would not believe uh, when I say that on Twitter and some of the non-fantasy, the real-life Twitter fans come out of the woodworks, start complaining. So... PFF Lily stat uh, for AJ Brown. So and this is the upside. This is why we're chasing him as hard as we are. He's only had six career games with more than eight targets. In those games, he's gone 10 catches, 151 yards, touchdown. Eight catches, 114 yards, touchdown. Seven catches, 112 yards, touchdown. Four catches, 101 yards, touchdown. Six catches, 83 yards, touchdown. And his worst performance, seven catches, 82 yards, and a touchdown. A.J. Brown has not missed when he's gotten more than eight targets, and there's a very real chance we see that become a weekly occurrence in 2021. And for that reason, he is my wide receiver, two, only behind Devontae Adams for now. And people, the second Aaron Rodgers, if when he's traded, it will be the A.J.B. wide receiver one season. I'm not saying he's tears ahead of everybody. I do think he's right there. Tyree Kill, Stephon Diggs, DeAndre Hopkins. I, you know, if you wanted to make an argument that any of them are ahead of Brown or even Devontae, you know, I would not call you an idiot i do think you can make that case and you know what if julio does come to town i would drop brown out of that first tier into the second one where i i think it's still in his potential range of outcomes but you know he would certainly be closer to that wide receiver eight to ten uh range for me as i was saying though still a wide receiver one so that's going to wrap this one up if you uh want to check out our other pff podcast though i really encourage you guys to check out pff's podcast network which covers everything nfl college and fantasy football you can recap the nfl draft at Mike Renner and Austin Gales, two for one drafts podcast, or get all the 2021 betting content you need with the PFF forecast. Also, if you like fantasy football and if you like playing fantasy for money, you need to check out Underdog Fantasy. Underdog's got everything, including season long and playoff best ball. Best ball is a season long game where you draft a team like you normally do, but that's it. There's no in season roster management. Underdog automatically selects your best performers each week, saving you loads of time. Go to Underdog Fantasy and deposit ten dollars using promo code PFF and get a free PFF Edge Channel subscription. That's promo code PFF. Draft now at Underdog Fantasy. Thank you as always for tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. Everybody, I'm Ian Harditz. You can find all my work on PFF.com on Twitter at iHarditz. And as always, we have fantasy files coming out every single day throughout the soft season. Corresponding article on the site. Also, regular Wednesday and Friday editions of the podcast as well. So again, thank you for tuning in. Until next time, take care, everybody.